Hi, I'm Femi OK. Welcome to the stream. We have spoken many times on this show about policing in America, particularly in the context of minorities. Today, we're going to look at how would you reimagine the police, reimagine policing in the United States. We're joined by Professor Philip Atiba Goff. He has some solutions and answers, and I really want to dig deep into his work. Professor, so good to see you. Will you tell everybody what it is that you do, how you do it, and your center by way of introduction? Go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, briefly, so I'm a professor uh, at Yale. Um, I'm in the African American Studies Department as well as the Psychology Department. I'm also the co-founder and the CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, um, which is a nonprofit that is affiliated with Yale. We work with communities and mm. with law enforcement to make uh, policing less racist, less deadly, and less present in the places where they don't need to be. I was very cautious about saying this show is about police reform because police reform is an incredibly sensitive phrase and incredibly controversial right now. How do you understand what that is? Right, so the word reform, um, it usually means to take something um, uh, that isn't working quite the way you want it to be and you, you fix it so that it's working the way you want it to be, yeah. right? As if the thing is broken um, and it just needs some fixing, some reform to make it work right. Well, there are a lot of folks in black communities where we work, in brown communities and native communities where we work, who think that policing in the United States is working exactly the way that it was intended. And so you can't reform that. You need to tear it down and build something else up in its place. Um, and I think that in most of the communities where we work, the majority of folks want some kind of combination of the two. Um, they want the things that they've got to be less deadly and less racist, but they also want something else in its place. So when you think about policing, right, <clears throat> that is a punishment. It's a, it's a system of punishment, an entryway into a criminal legal system. But it often shows up uh, predominantly in the communities where people make choices within systems where all they've got are terrible options. So if we really want to keep people safe, wouldn't we give them the resources so that they can keep themselves safe before law enforcement ever shows up? That's what people are saying we would do if we had a real system of public safety instead of doing policing. Professor, I want to show our audience the page of your organization. We do science to promote justice, data science for justice. How do you measure justice? So this is here on my laptop. One of the reasons you came to prominence in the United States was because you said, we can look at race through the lens of science. Will you explain to our audience how you do that? Because that's key to your work. Yeah, it's, it's fundamental to the work that we do. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, a, a ex exploiting the bad ways we've defined racism in the first place to try and make things better. Right, so if I come in to you and I say, hi, I'm Dr. Blackenstein, my job is to diagnose whether or not you <laughs> and your heart yeah. are racist, yeah. um, that is not a welcome thing for me to do. Right, I'm not getting invited to many dinners for that, nobody's op opening up their homes or their cities or their police departments for it. Yeah. But if I say instead, well, racism is really about a pattern of behaviors and you don't want to engage in behaviors that are discriminatory, right? Mm, mm. So if we measure those behaviors and the part that's your responsibility, not just randomly the things that happen that are bad, but the part that you are, are, are contributing, well, then we can make it go down. We can manage the behavior. Right? The best way to stop someone from punching you in the face is stopping them from punching you in the face. It's not complicated. Yeah. We don't have to go in and do therapy on them. We don't have to give them trainings. We regulate the behavior just like every organization that's ever been successful regulates every behavior that matters to its existence. Professor, we tapped into our community on the stream and guests who've been on the stream before, guests we know we're good friends with. So we wanted a police sergeant to be in this conversation with us. This is Amy King, and she brings up the idea of implicit bias. I'm going to play this to you. I want to get your response. So at the end of the video, just go ahead and respond. Here she is. I think law enforcement agencies should tackle the issue of implicit bias when we tackle those types of topics, those things that impact and exist in all of us, um, I think the most uh, potential for success in those areas is when that work is very personal. Um, and I think a key component of that starts with leadership, whether formal or informal, um, creating a culture that um, promotes and supports and encourages um, that work to um, be ongoing. 
I also think that it's important uh, that not only law enforcement looks at this issue, but that a lot of our other systems, our housing system, our education system, our medical system, as well begin to take a look at the implicit bias that may exist or does exist um, in other systems. Yeah, so it's, it's a great comment. Um, and so while I didn't quite hear a question, I think that the question is, all right, so what about that? Yeah. Um, uh, how, what does that look bias. like out yeah. in the in the in the context of the places where we work? Exactly. Um, and so I heard two things in there. One, please don't make this an issue where racism only exists in policing. Right. There's no community on Earth that says, you know what? We live in perfect harmony, one with the other. Uh, our economic systems are working wonderfully. Our, our jobs are fantastic. Our schools are fantastic. It's just those pesky police. That's never happened ever in the history of humanity. So if we've got problems with public safety, with law enforcement, we're going to have problems in other portions of the criminal legal system. Um, uh, we're going to have health problems. We're going to have housing problems. We're going to have economic problems. We're going to have education problems. And of course, if you've got police as the catch-all for all of those things, as we have in too much of the United States then all of those problems are going to end up right, predicting contact with law enforcement. So I'm really glad that she said that. It's a really important component of it. But the other piece I heard her say was, we got to get personal with this. There's real personal transformation that needs to happen if we're going to ta tackle issues of racism. And it's tempting to make that the only thing. It's tempting to say, this is a personal journey towards being a better human. I understand the temptation. Hmm. I have to say we have to push back on it. Because when we make racism about only, only the hearts and minds of individual racists, then we become overly concerned with the salvation of white people instead of protecting the bodies and the lives of black and brown people. So implicit bias trainings, sure, there is a place for them. They can raise awareness and they can be part of a broader cultural shift towards doing better in any organization. But we have to resist the temptation to, to describe the problem as if it resides only in the hearts and minds of people who've got those things contaminated. It has to be about the behaviors, and we have to center black life. That's why we say Black Lives Matter. That's why it's been such a, an important moment and an important language for right now. If we don't, we end up doing racism with our definition of racism. Let's talk about practical ways to reimagine the police. On YouTube, I'm going to start with some comments on YouTube for you, Professor, and then you can tell me what you and your organisation are doing with actual police forces around the country. So Tom, thank you, Tom, for being part of the conversation, says, you have to end qualified immunity. That would stop police from shooting so many Americans. The police walk around like they can do whatever they want. Well, because they can, with zero repercussions. You all have data that tells you what about if Tom's suggestion here, the police can do whatever they want, they walk around shooting Americans, what does the data tell us? Right, so the data on qualified immunity is, um, it's twofold. One, it's that qualified immunity might, might be applied to a relatively smaller number of cases than we think. It's about 25%, a little bit less than, 25% uh, of cases um, involving uh, uh, deadly force when police shoot and kill somebody. Right. So it's like private prisons in that way. They're so sinister. It's such an absurd sort of twisting of fairness and law and order um, that it's a popular target. We should get rid of it a thousand percent. Um, but it's not the biggest thing and it's certainly not the only thing that we can be doing. The other piece that I heard and the other portion of the data is this moral element that if there were real consequences when you killed a black person, you would have fewer black people getting killed. And surely that could be true. Um, we have so few folks who get charged with killing black folks in the line um, and within law enforcement that it's hard to say what a change would be, but even the smallest of changes could be felt. Mm. I just offer one note of caution to that. That's what we call back end accountability. That's the thing that happens after someone's already dead. And I would prefer that if we're gonna do that, we also have front end accountability rules, procedures, regulations that prevent the shooting from happening in the first place. Because let's all remember, we say justice for George Floyd and justice for Breonna Taylor, but there can't be justice for people who are already dead. We can only have it. Mm. Professor... Reality. Yes. <clears throat> Professor, no, I, sorry, go ahead. I, I, I'm wondering, what kind of police department invites you in to help them? Is it a really rotten one? 
always in a great one, right? Very woke, progressive. We're, we're, we're one with our community. We want you to come in and, and help us. I mean, for instance, would the Chicago police say, hey, we'd like to work with you? Would that ever happen? Well, it's entirely possible. Um, what I'll say is that uh, we, we go in when law enforcement invites us in, yeah. and now increasingly we go in when communities are asking as well. Mm -hmm. And communities all over the country, large cities, small cities, progressive, not as progressive, um, uh, they're asking for this because there's no community that feels like this isn't touching them, even the smallest communities here in Connecticut. Um, <clears throat> but when it's police departments, I'll say it's one of two types usually. It's either very progressive and they want to be on the, on the bleeding edge of it, or they're worried they're about to, or they've just had a critical incident that's causing a major problem. Mm. Um, and in those situations, it kind of doesn't matter what the politics are. They know they're going to have to lead or get dragged. You're triage. And everybody would rather lead. Yeah. That's right. All right, so what's triage then? When you've got to go in, in an emergency, what would, you, what would you say, what would you do? What, a, what has worked? Give us one example. There's, there's one I want to, I want to share, because I, I love you talking about this, which was the number of people who were being shot because they were running away from the police. Right. And it's Give not us that just example. Being shot, yeah. right? It's not just being shot. I want to be yeah. really clear. Yeah. Police use of force is, is guns, but it's tasers, as we just saw tragically in Monroe, Louisiana. Um, yeah. Just yesterday, we saw the video. Um, it's, it's just fist beatings. You beat somebody up, put their hands behind their back, they can die of suffocation. So it's all use of force. Um, and I think the example you're thinking about is in Las Vegas uh, Police Department, Indeed, um, yes. where they were concerned um, that they were using force too much. They were concerned because the community was telling them they were using force too much. And it turns out a lot of it was coming after foot pursuits. And foot pursuits are just literally where someone runs away and an officer pursues them on foot, not in a vehicle. Now, it doesn't end usually, at least not in Las Vegas, the way it does in the movie, right, where the old black cop um, tackles the young guy and says, I'm getting too old for this stuff. It ends with the young guy who's much faster than the officer saying, I'm faster than you, but I'm not faster than radio. I'm about to be surrounded. Please don't hurt me. But if I'm an officer, my adrenaline's up, my heart rate is pumping. I know they're a bad guy because who runs from the police but bad guys. That means even if you surrender peacefully, I'm giving you a shot to the kidneys for the price of making me run. And so in Las Vegas, when we came back with that information, say, hey, it's your foot pursuits that seem to be a big portion of the problem, both the community and law enforcement knew right away how to manage that which is slow it down. Teach the officers to count to 10, tell them don't touch the person until till backup arrives. Give signals that if this is not an immediate danger, mm -hmm. then you don't need to put hands on someone. Um, and they were able to reduce their use of force by 23% in, almost immediately after uh, doing that training. I wanna be clear, trainings are usually a very weak lever for change, but in this case, it was training accompanied by a policy right? And it was organization-wide backed up by the community. That's what ultimately produced a major change. First, I'm going to bring into our conversation Rashawn Ray. He's a governance studies fellow at the Brookings Institution. He's pretty cynical about how you reimagine the police. This is what he told us earlier. Is policing in the United States solvable? I'm unsure. It's, out, it's outlasted the end of slavery and Jim Crow and seemed to increase under the first black identifying president. Every eight hours in the United States, a person is killed by police. And black people are 3.5 times more likely than whites to be killed by police when they're not attacking or have a weapon. But racism can be held accountable. And I think it starts with abolishing qualified immunity and then also creating police department insurance policies, as well as police officer malpractice insurance to hold people accountable for the police brutality that they inflict on local communities. Yeah, so, uh, so we've, we've just talked about qualified immunity. On the issue of insurance, um, it's a sticky wicket. Um, and the reason is because uh, you get unions that will say, well, we don't want individual officers have to carry insurance, so we'll end up managing it. Um, and that ends up being, again, taxpayer money going back into it, so there's not an actual individual uh, risk. Like, all that is a sticky wicket. There are, I think, more straightforward ways to go at this, which is just stop asking law enforcement to do things that they shouldn't be doing. The last quarter century, as I've been in this work, law enforcement has said, you ask us to do too much. You ask us to come and be a therapist to someone who's having a mental health crisis, be a substance abuse counselor to someone who's got an addiction problem, um, be a, a, a child counselor to someone who's got a child welfare issue, right? job placement counselor, a homeless counselor. We can't do all of that. We want to do all of that. So stop do all of that. Um, and if we did, We'd be now meeting the demands of activists and protesters who are saying, remove law enforcement from those positions, 
right? There's no amount of training that's going to get it perfect. But if we've stopped punishing in the spaces that are very clearly underinvested and we refund to the community what we've only invested in law enforcement, I think that's the way to, to start reducing this. And then we can see the, the reforms, again, the things that are changing the systems we've got, start having a much bigger effect because there's a much smaller footprint in the first place. You know, I, I, I like the idea about what you're talking about in terms of getting more funding back into the community. We talked to Bruce Franks Jr., who's, who's been on our show many yeah. times. He's also a, a protester, Black Lives Matter uh, a protester, organizer, and he has had run-ins with the police um, and difficulties with the police. So this is what he had to say about this idea of reimagining the police. Have a listen. My encounter with police has been the same as many of um, black people in America. Um, but what I will say is there's no way to reform this system. Um, you can't give more training um, to train out racism, to train out white supremacy. Um, the only way to go is to abolish and defund um, the entire system, specifically the police. Um, we know what it was rooted in, and it's time that we take those resources and put them back into the communities that they were stripped out of or never had in the first place. Yeah, and this is what I hear um, from folks in the communities that are, are worst hit um, by police violence. Um, uh, it's what I hear from national leaders um, uh, who have been in this uh, you know, space with us um, for the last quarter century, who've been saying, you know what, this incremental stuff, um, uh, that's not the place that I want to be. Um, I'll say that before this past summer, uh, there, was, there was a lot of, of difficulty getting anybody to listen to the idea of uh, abolition or defunding. Now we hear it as the sort of de rigueur. That's exactly what you have to be saying if you're in these national spaces. But what, what, the, what, what we're hearing from that, that protester and protesters in general, um, <clears throat> why are you asking law enforcement to enforce low-level traffic problems? Mm. If, if my crime is that I bought a pack of cigarettes and then I sold them to other people individually, why, do I, why are you introducing a badge and a gun to that? If my crime is that I don't have a place to live, like indoors, why are you bringing a badge and a gun into that situation? And the fact that we've decided that we need armed responders for that is a complete sort of relinquishing of our moral responsibility to the folks who are most vulnerable. That is of a piece with the worst origin stories of why we have policing in the United States and not just here. This is not just a US problem, it's a Nigerian problem, it's a Brazilian problem, um, it's an Australian problem. This is an international problem where we've decided there are some people we don't want to see, some problems we don't want to know about, and so we're just going to give them punishment instead of actually digging in and helping to make their lives better. It's not an unreasonable or even that radical of a position. It's also not new. Du Bois in 1935 writes about abolition democracy in the United States. W.B. Du Bois, the famous sociologist in the U.S. So this is not a new idea. It's just having a rebirth in popularity right now, and we have to take it seriously. When we spoke to you, Professor, earlier on this week, we were getting ready for this show, um, and there was a district attorney for North Carolina uh, talking about... Um, hmm, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him introduce the words. I, I don't want to summarise them, because we have them right here. And it's about Andrew Brown, Jr., who was shot and killed by the police. This is how the district attorney explained what the situation was and whether there would be any repercussions for the police involved. Let's have a listen, have a look from just this week. The law enforcement officers were duty bound to stand their ground, carry through on the performance of their duties and take Andrew Brown into custody. They could not simply let him go as has been suggested. Mr. Brown's death, while tragic, was justified because Mr. Brown's actions caused three deputies with the Pasquotank County Sheriff's Office to reasonably believe it was necessary to use deadly force to protect themselves and others. Yeah, no. Just no. That's the response I have. Um, if you say a black person did the things that required and not not willing to look at that set that up in the first place, then you're not serious about keeping black people alive. You're only trying to say, yeah, they deserved it. 
because of what they did, they deserved it. And they have not released the full video. Like we're seeing pieces of it now. But if they'd actually released it, um, then maybe you could have community folks make a determination. Maybe the family um, could say, yeah, I understand that was really tragic. But if you have the family saying, nope, that's a lie. Um, you have folks not being able to see the video uh, until well after the DA makes this determination. You're not interested in, in communities having say over the ways in which they're, they're kept safe. If you cannot imagine that there's a world where that black person didn't need to die, then you probably shouldn't be in charge of whether or not black people get to live and die. That's the very minimum of what black folks are asking for in the United States right now. I have seen your interaction with people online. You're very accessible. You, you have conversations with people. So I know you, you won't mind me putting some of these trickier thoughts from YouTube to you. This is Bobby. He says, how about criminals start following the rules? Your instant reaction, Professor, is what? So if Bobby really feels like that is the heart of it, then I guess he believes that law enforcement should be able to summarily execute anyone they feel like is not complying with a lawful order quickly enough. That would be the definition of a totalitarian state and not a democracy, and I'd suggest Bobby goes to civics classes. This is the problem. We imagine that that moment, right there, when people are making decisions, is the only moment that matters, as opposed to the set of policies that set that into place, and then we, we have a discussion about whether or not that one black person deserved to die. We talk about whether or not the shooting was justified, but really we're talking about did they deserve to die. It's a really, it's a necrophilic, kind of uh, approach to black death. And I would just encourage us all, take a look at that. You can say, I don't agree with these actions, but did it warrant death? That's it. <laughs> did it warrant death? Did selling loose cigarettes when I bought a pack of cigarettes, did that warrant me being choked to death as it did for Eric Garner? And if you say yes, I would just encourage you, please don't be in charge of other people's lives because that's a terrible answer. Professor, I'm going to go back to a year ago, so May 2020. I'm going to get everybody to have a look here. This is your Twitter feed. This broke me. Just started ugly crying about 10 seconds in and couldn't stop. Tell these stories. Heal this pain. We spent the last five days talking about George Floyd police and property damage. Show black humanity. See us. All caps. You know that Professor here is yelling. I'm just going to show a little bit of what broke you. It's going to happen 10 years from now. And at 26, you're going to be doing the same thing I'm doing. You understand that? 10 years. You're going to be right here too. But he also got to So what I need y'all to do right now at 16 is come up with a better way. Because how we doing it, it ain't working. He angry at 46. I'm angry at 31. You angry at 16. So, Professor, that's, that's a year ago, right, almost to the day. And I am looking at you, watching you unpack what is happening with police, how you reimagine police, using data, using science. But you are a black man in America in 2021. How do you do that? How do you keep going? How do you maybe use your own pain? in your work? When you're a kid, you touch a hot stove, your reflex says, pull back your hand. Pain is a message. It's a warning that what's happening is not supposed to be happening. Um, at its most extreme, it's a warning that death is close by. Black people live with that pain in the United States so often it's like our clothing. Sometimes it's the houses that we live in, literally. So I don't use the pain to fuel the work. I want to make sure that I don't lose that, mm -hmm. that I don't miss out on the connection with the folks from where I'm from, from my ancestors. You know, like Thank my you. mother, you know, two master's degrees, her mother. Yeah. Right? Master's degree, her mother, college, and her mother born into slavery in the United States. Professor Philip Atiba Goff, the work continues. Thank you for sharing it with us here on the stream. We appreciate you. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you next time.